Again, I say rejoice, Paul says in Philippians 4, 4 to 13. Rejoice in the Lord always. So says Paul, and so do I. Really, Pastor? Really, Paul? Rejoice always? Are you kidding me? Always? That's easy for you to say, Paul. That's easy for you to say, Pastor. You don't know what I'm going through. If you did, you wouldn't be telling me to rejoice always. I mean, come on. What are you saying? What have I been doing and what have you been doing for the last past eight to nine months? COVID has, rab COVID has ravaged my society, my friends, my family. Most of us know people who have contracted the illness. And worse yet, we may know people who have personally died from this illness. How can I rejoice about putting a mask on every day? How can I rejoice about not hugging the people that I care for? How can I rejoice being conscious of the distance when walking and when talking? Besides that, you know there are bills to pay, food to buy, gasoline for the car, house maintenance, you know, things that were difficult enough even before the pandemic started and even when I had a job much less now that I have been laid off or may have even lost my job. How can I rejoice? And besides all that, my self-confidence is shaken. I no longer feel confident to go out in society, to talk with my neighbors, to even go grocery shopping. I can't exercise. I can't go to the gym. I have to do breathing and lung exercises, deep breathing in the mornings, afternoons, just to counter my inactivity. I'm holding out for the vaccine. Something has to come along. But my safety is not only due to this COVID, it's the violence, the protests, the lack of security, law, justice, injustice, the haggling, bickering, squabbling, backbiting behavior of politicians that the Lord says he has put in civil authority to keep all people orderly and behave decently. It's crumbled. If I can't go out from fear of contamination, I fear for criminal assault while I'm out as well. So, worse yet, I got to say my confidence and faith in the Lord has also taken a hit. How can he let this continue? How can he allow such a mess to interfere even with my faith life and my church life. I mean, I haven't been able to go to church. I haven't been able to be seen with my faith family. Among the businesses that have closed, there is a greater danger that congregations will close as well. Will mine? Will you, O oh Lord, allow your congregations to close even mine? What about that, Pastor? Rejoice? Why? 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 These are common enough questions. And the first question that comes to our mind. When something like what has happened upon us for the last eight to nine months has happened, accentuated by politics and the frailty and partisan behavior of our leadership, the lack of human care, the growth of selfish human behavior, when someone, a friend or loved one dies, we immediately wonder why. It's a knee-jerk reaction to any situation. And it's not a question that wants to know an immediate primal cause. Rather, the question seeks a distal, deeper reason. Why? What caused it? But also, why? What's the purpose in it? Why? We all know why. We all know what caused it. Sin. There is no greater testimony of the truth of Scripture than to see that all of creation, biologically and civically, has sinned. Sin is not merely what we do, it is in our very nature. COVID is not sent by God as judgment, it is part of creation which from the beginning has rejected God as their creator and father and is part of the DNA of all that surrounds us. 
It is, in fact, part of our fallen world, not intended by God, but the result of imperfection and wholeness on our part. Scripture puts it this way, nobody is righteous. No, not one. All have fallen short of the glory of God in Romans 3.23. The whole world groans as in labor pain of travail waiting for the kingdom of God. Paul says in Romans 8, we know the answer why. It's because as a creation which we are all a part of has gone off the deep end. Biology, biologically, we've gone off the deep end. Death results because of sin, because of fallenness. Civil unrest happens because of sin. Illnesses happen deeply rooted in sin. The wages of sin is death, destruction, decay. We won't get any better. And then we also ask why, meaning what's the purpose in it? The purpose is shown in God's patience. That seems funny. Although God could wipe out all sin and evil with the wave of his hand, cause the world to end at any moment like he did when he sent a flood, his purpose is that creation turn back to him. His promise was that he would never destroy the world like he did with the flood. His desire is that creation turns back to him, to worship him as their creator and redeemer. With the impending imminence of death and judgment, God is patient and waiting for those whom he created to recognize their sins, their evil, and need to have and know him as their creator and redeemer. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you have contempt for the wealth of his kindness, forbearance, and patience? And yet, do not know that this kindness of God leads you to repentance? You see, even the injustice, even the diseases, even the evil in this world is ultimately subject to his sovereignty and salvation plan through his Son. Not that he causes it, but that it's allowed our full-blown sinful condition and world of mayhem to be an instrument through which his mercy may be shown and known through repentance. This is the whole message behind the parable of the prodigal son. And it's kind of like this, in other words. It's like a child who refuses to use a helmet when learning to ride a bicycle. Arguing with parents to put it on for protection, the child ventures out without it. The parents, frustrated, allow it. The child gets hurt. The child returns to the parents. The parent continues to love the child, even in his or her disobedience, hoping that one day the child will listen. And then the parents bind up the child, they forgive the child, and their relationship has been restored. So this is God and his mercy. Why? What purpose is all of this? giving the opportunity for his call to repentance and mercy to go out. And look at how that has been done. And that is the real qu question that Christians should ask. How? Instead of why, wondering why, we should ask and see how God is present in the present even in the worst case scenarios of our lives as they are now, how is God present? Not why does it happen? How is the Lord present today? Not in judgment, but in mercy, calling all to himself as he has always done. Churches online. More attendance. If people didn't come to the churches and they were in a building, now more people can go online. And that is exactly what they have done. Since the pandemic, even though congregations have not been able to meet 
worship services online have attracted additional numbers to worship services. Feeling bad or perhaps depressed or perhaps lonely, they have nowhere else to turn. The pandemic has spurred into action different ways of worshiping, of proclaiming God's word to a host of people who now feel the need for it, who would never have been open to it before. In fact, one incident made such an impression on me. I believe it is something that Grace and all Christian churches should be called to do. One day, while eating breakfast, I received a phone call from an unlisted number. It went immediately to voicemail, and I listened to the message. The message was a calm woman's voice reading a passage from Isaiah and saying that all of this illness would end. For further information, she added, for more information, visit us online at jw.org. My exclamation was not a good word. Wow. This is the Jehovah's Witness. They can't knock on doors, so they're leaving voice messages. Why didn't I think of this? What a great way to reach out. Where people are not coming to church, even a heretical Christian posing group, the church is going to them. So I researched and discovered that Zillow will give you addresses in your surrounding area. Another website will give you phone numbers, both cellular and landline related with those addresses. And another marketing website has special deal for Christian churches who want to send out mass messages to over a thousand phone numbers at a time plus set up lines where people can call in for devotions, messages, prayers, notes for follow-up calls from elders or pastors. What a great way to reach out, even if there are five people in a thousand that have lost hope, that have given up because of our country's situation. Those five people will hear a message of hope. It reminded me of Abraham's petitioning to the Lord before the Lord destroyed the city of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 20 and 21. Abraham says, please do not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. If there are 45 righteous people, will you not destroy it? The Lord said, if there are 45 righteous people, I will not destroy it. So Abraham says, what about 30? If there are 30, I won't destroy it. What about 20? If there are 20, I won't destroy it. What if there are 10? If there are 10, I won't destroy it. But there were none who were righteous, and it was destroyed. So if there is one in a thousand who will listen to the Lord's invitation, will his word go out from among us? Another case is the Christian Lutheran churches in San Francisco with Ethiopian pastors. They're online anyway, but they have expanded their congregation they now broadcast through a website in Texas, sending from here to Texas, um, to channels in Ethiopia that are televising their worship services. And also throughout Canada, where there are pockets of the Ethiopian community who do not have pastoral leadership. Another case of how the Lord is present, even now in this crisis, Eli is a pastor in Wasco. Wasco, California, Eli Jimenez. He met the LCMS a few years ago and started attending the Lutheran congregation in Wasco. He has a Spanish-speaking, he has <clears throat> a Spanish-speaking congregation and was sent from Mexico to do mission work and start educating Christian leaders, pastors. His relationship grew with the LCMS and with that congregation. The English-speaking congregation, however, had to close. And they asked that Eli and his congregation stay in the building and care for it. And they've done so for the past three years. Eli did and started a seminary for educating future leaders and pastors. That was in 2018. They had their first graduation class of 10 people and both President Lang and I were present. This past Wednesday, President Lang and I spoke with him to see how it was going because Ali wants more Lutheran theological ed training and get into a master's program. Ali told us that he could not start studying at this time, however. Why? 
because his seminary with students numbering around 15 or 20 at the most in the last two years has now grown to 100 plus students. How? Because the classes had to go online and people heard about it in Texas, in Mexico, in Arizona, in Argentina. And so his seminary exploded where there are now not enough pastors or teachers to be able to teach. He's also invited to these places to start satellite programs once COVID is contained. How is the Lord present today in this situation? Clearly seen and outweighs the question, why did this happen? Even all these things are subject to the Lord. How is the Lord present? He is present in, with, and under bread and wine, where he gives us his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins, that means the restoration of our relationship with him now and eternally. We are his. We no longer belong to the ways and the end results of this world. Where there is no hope for the future in the world, we are assured that we belong to him. Where there is no faith in the person sitting next to you to do the right thing, we are assured that the right thing, the salvation of the world, has been accomplished in him and through the death and resurrection of his own son. So great is God's love for you that he sent his one and only son to share in and suffer those things which we now suffer, our insecurities, doubts, injustices, torments, both physical but also spiritual and emotional. Why? Because there was and is no way out for us, no way out of any redeeming quality that we or any other person may have, that we should place our hope in ourselves or in others or in medical cures or in the economy or in the right presidential candidate. And his love given and shed is not only for you, but for his own creation. His patience, as Paul says in Romans, is great and purposeful to allow even that which pains and hurts God, our sinfulness and suffering, to drive us and all of creation back into his arms of mercy. So how is the Lord present in this situation? Let he and she who has ears, let them hear. The Lord is present. How does he want us to be present and rejoice? even now in this situation, through his word. The Lord's Supper, baptism, he shows us and calls us, I am here. Though the world hate you, though the world go to pieces and despise you, though suffering is present in every corner, I am here. And I want more. I want all people to know me. And to this end, he sends us, go. Tell others the truth behind the why of suffering, death, injustice, and dishonesty, so that you and all people might find how God has handled that through Christ and is still present today, redeeming, redeeming and offering the world himself through his Son. His patience is a reason to rejoice. His forgiveness is a reason to rejoice. His son's resurrection is a reason to rejoice. Our eternal life is a reason to rejoice. The new life and hope in this world is a reason to rejoice. Because he sees and is not finished until the day he returns, at which time every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Then our rejoicing will be fulfilled. It will be whole, it will be complete, lacking in nothing, because all of this, all of which we suffer now, will be ultimately and finally eradicated. You know, during this election time, one presidential candidate made a remark regarding the pandemic. He said, you can expect no miracle to happen. He said, you can expect no miracle to happen, really. Losing sight of God's unbreakable promise to his creation can expect no miracle. But a miracle has happened. God is patient and calls all people to himself and the miracle, miracle of salvation and ultimate victory through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, has happened. 
a miracle has happened. And for that we say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice.